Um, so I'm going to hand over to Rona McGovern, uh, Rhonda McGovern, who's going to introduce our first keynote, Iris Muller. Thanks, everyone. Hello, and welcome to you all. It's a great honour and privilege to greet you today and to introduce you to our first keynote speaker at the 52nd Conference of Irish Geographers 2021. My name is Rhonda McGovern, and I'm a PhD student based in the Centre for Environmental Humanities in Trinity. Professor Iris Muller is the Head of Department of Geography within the School of Natural Sciences at Trinity College. She is a coastal geomorphologist whose work focuses on the interaction of physical and biological processes at the coast, <clears throat> particularly the intertidal zone. Professor Muller's groundbreaking and internationally recognised PhD research produced the first convincing field evidence that salt marshes provide a buffering sea defence service reducing the impact of waves during storm surges by at least 15%. Iris's ongoing work with her coastal research team in Trinity has strong implications for the development of risk management strategies in relation to coastal erosion and coastal flooding. With 10% of the global population living on or near the coast, and with changing climate patterns that do not adhere to social or political boundaries, this work led by Professor Muller is important beyond the borders of our shared island. <clears throat> Prior to joining Trinity, Iris was the Deputy Director of the University of Cambridge's Coastal Research Unit and University Lectureship in, in Physical Geography, teaching coastal processes at the Department of Geography at Cambridge. She collaborates across the EU, UK, China, Australia and the USA on projects that aim to develop a better understanding of how coastal wetlands function and deliver a range of ecosystem services. Collaborations are a key aspect of Iris' work and have led her to consider the interconnections we make with our surrounding environment and how these connections play out within, within our discipline. The focus of our keynote examines the origins and development of geography and it teases out the questions concerning where we are going. The title of the talk is Divide or Conquer, Personal Reflections on Geography as a Discipline at a Time of Existential Global Challenges which Iris hopes will lead to a lively discussion in the Q&A. We ask that you keep your audio settings on mute throughout the talk. Please type any questions you may have for Iris into the chat box and I will put them to her in the Q&A section at the end. Equally, if you'd rather ask a question yourself, raise your hand in the participants chat box and when called upon, unmute your mic and ask your question. Please join me in welcoming the esteemed Professor Iris Muller. Thank you very much, Rhonda. I'm just going to put my screen sharing on here. Does that work? Now, I don't know if you can see my screen. Yeah, your your screen sharing now. Yeah, that's weird because it hasn't got. It normally has a green line around it, and it doesn't. But we'll see. Okay, cool. It's there. Thank you so much, Rhonda. That was a lovely introduction. And it's um, an absolute pleasure to be speaking to you all here today. Um, it, it's a real privilege and I'm really grateful to this super, superb organizing team. I think all the names that Kian reeled off there just um, suggests that, uh, you know, this is a, a massive team effort and so many people have provided an input and I've done virtually nothing. So. Um, so it's been a really fantastic thing to see come to fruition and there's such a colourful palette of talks for everybody on offer this week and, and a real honour to be able to kick that process off of discussions. Now when I was first asked to do the keynote, as Kian said, it was you know more than a, a year ago and um, I, I agreed because I obviously I, I, I had to do it, I'd just arrived um, in, in Ireland and at Trinity but I really felt not very well prepared. I felt that I didn't really know the institution. I didn't really know Irish geography that much. And so then I thought, okay, um, you know, I was quite relieved when it was postponed for a year. And I thought, oh, that gives me a bit of time to get my thoughts together. But little did I know what kind of a year this would be. So I feel no more prepared than I did last year, I, I have to say. Um, and I hope you'll forgive me for giving a keynote that's perhaps not as academically informed as it might otherwise have been. Um, so I snuck in the word personal in there for to give me a get out clause to make this a little bit more of a kind of personal story. 
But I think that perhaps is useful because when we think about our discipline, you know, it's always a discipline of individuals and each and every one of you will have um, a little story to tell. So um, if, if you wanted to, I have a little experiment running here and I'm not entirely sure if that will work, um, but there is this site menti.com and there is a code and if it does work, it should allow you to, to interact and put, put in some words as to what the key sort of big challenges are that you're currently working on. Um, now I tried it out earlier and then it suddenly said voting stopped. So I, I tried to reinitiate the site and if it doesn't work, please don't worry about it. We've got plenty of opportunity to share our um, different experiences later on. So um, my, my thoughts here are heavily influenced by a number of, of events and people, but primarily actually they, were, they came into focus in 2018, roughly in Cambridge when I was leading their teaching review, this was principally a physical geography teaching review. And um, we ba ba basically brainstormed what the, the point of physical geography um, was. And there are a number, a number of colleagues that I um, discussed my ideas and their ideas with, and, and of course, you know, I have to acknowledge them all. Um, here, or there'd be too many names to acknowledge here, but we discussed questions like societal and environmental challenges that we would like to see our graduates um, be well, well prepared to address when they move out into society. We discuss the technical skills that, that we felt graduates should have once they've gone through their geography degree. And um, it's those questions that really sparked off a bit of reading that I then did, did in, the, in the background and that I did afterwards. And then um, of course, further discussions with students and with colleagues, and most importantly, here, Professor Tom Spencer, who I co-directed the Coastal Research Unit with in Cambridge for 21 years. So um, my, my reflections are then also um, partly to blame for, to, to, to the person, whoever it was, who came up with the question that I was asked to think about when I applied for my post at Trinity. And that was um, to think about the future of geography at Trinity. And um, it's not that I hadn't thought about the future of geography prior to that point, but um, certainly when you're being asked that question for as part of a job interview, you, it puts it into very sharp focus. And it also made me appreciate that actually what defines um, the future of a discipline or of a discipline within an institution is such a broad spectrum of internal and external factors that um, it's very difficult to do it justice in a short period of time. So I will try my best in this discussion here, but um, I would like to approach this discussion really with an, an upfront recognition that the discipline is you, the discipline is everyone who's listening in here, everyone who has joined the Conference of Irish Geographers, and so who am I to, to tell you about it really? It needs a discussion between us all. Um, I'm hugely great, grateful to those of you who filled in this little questionnaire that I sent around in the spirit of, of all of that. And I, I ambushed the, the UK Heads of Geography meeting last Friday and snuck a link to the questionnaire into the chat. So there may well have been some UK Heads of um, Disciplines who've also contributed as a result of that. So. I'm also, of course, biased because I'm a physical geographer by and large, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I do in this talk, but not very much. Um, so I want to split this talk this morning into kind of two parts. And the first one is really to um, address the, uh, if I can get my pointer going here, to, ad to address the kind of what and who, in particular the who is important when we define uh, what a discipline is. And, and clearly I'm giving this this speech. So I'll outline a little bit of where I've come from and where I've come to learn to see the discipline of geography, how I've come to learn to see the discipline of geography in the way that I do now. Um, and, and then we will turn our, our minds towards some critical challenges that I will actually let you sort of speak through the questionnaire a little bit and I'll present some of the results, but that should nicely lead into a discussion afterwards. So the first part of the talk is really about um, how I came um, to geography. And as, as I've mentioned to you, I moved to Ireland with the family in 2019. And in the process of moving, as you do, you know, you go into the loft and into the attic and you get all sorts of things down from the attic. 
I got a box down that con contained all of my teenage diaries. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I really, and I hate, I love traveling, but I hate packing and I hate moving house, which doesn't bode well for my impending house move here in Ireland. But I decided rather than to pack, to just sit down and open a box and read my diaries. And I was really hoping that in those diaries, maybe I could find some clues as to what it was at the time of being a teenager that might have pointed in the direction in which I eventually ended up going with my career. And I was a bit disappointed because there was about 90% of the stuff was teenage trivia. So it took a while to find the bits that I really wanted to find. But it didn't take that long when I found them to remember what these key events were that um, led me to think about my future, what I wanted to do beyond my school. Um, so in 1983, I was a young teenager at the time, um, there was still the, the remnants of the Cold War and um, there was particularly the story of Stanislav Petrov, um, who was an official in charge of watching for US missiles being fired at Russia at the time. Now, he knew that the sophisticated IT systems weren't as sophisticated as they were meant out to, made out to be. And he got an alarm of several missiles that were apparently en route to Russia. He decided to not raise the alert, uh, very wisely so. Um, and therefore, he avoided nuclear war uh, through that decision not to act, because almost certainly Russia would have retaliated immediately had they become aware, the officials become aware. So I was outraged by that and wrote about that in my, in my diaries at length and the how could a world get itself into a situation like this. Now then, um, I, I was, uh, although I'd grown up, I've grown up in Belgium, we moved to Germany frequently, and that's my, my country of birth, and there was the emergence in Germany then of the environmental movements, and they were really partly sparked by this nuclear, anti-nuclear demonstration phase, and the Green Party, in fact, was founded in uh, 1980, if I'm not mistaken, and um, it rapidly emerged more prominently prominently into the public sphere then but um you know it, it, lots of different issues were protested about and for on the streets and a lot of these pictures actually contain my dad who's i believe this chap down here and then also on the boat here and he he actually made this neptune here to protest against the protect the pollution of the elbe river uh, acid rain came came up as a big issue um at the time and I tried to look into what causes acid rain and into the backgrounds to that. And, and it, it, that's, that's really where I guess my interest in geography as a sort of integrative discipline started to emerge. Now, um, the next year, 1984, um, was of course um, the, the year that the, the, you could say the digital revolution kind of began around this time. Um, <clears throat> and um, the Rio 1984 was, of course, some way removed from the Orwellian imagination. And I had, of course, no idea at the time that I would once move to the country where this um, future was being had been imagined. But we witnessed certainly the emergence of the digital age. And so while I, I was typing my dissertation uh, on a sort of electronic typewriter, my brother was my younger brother was playing on one of the first home computers in Atari um, late into the night. So then in 1986, we had Chernobyl. And um, it's interesting that actually now, years later, you know, we still use the fallout of Chernobyl to record salt marsh accretion. So this is this up here is Venice Lagoon. Uh, we have a spike here in uh, cesium-137, which is very clearly identifiable in the sedimentary record. We can um, call the salt marshes of Venice Lagoon and we can find the depth of that spike and we can figure out that the marshes have been accreting upwards um, at around a rate of two and a half millimetres a year and therefore um, not easily able to keep pace with sea level rise in that particular setting. So all this motivated me to look at university um, and what I could study at university. And it seemed that now I was taught by um, a geographer who'd been trained himself in Cambridge and the UK that must have had an influence, although it played absolutely no role for me at the time. I didn't even know this at the time. Um, but clearly the geography that I've been taught had something to do with this. So 
I went for an interview to to a university to, to Oxford in Britain actually, and um, so the 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 interview wasn't quite as bad as as me turning up in my pajamas, but I was certainly the only girl or woman, young woman there in trousers, which made me feel particularly self conscious at the time. But I was also interviewed by Professor Elaine Street Parrot, who, uh, having looked her up now recently, she's um, Professor Emeritus at Swansea now. And she's listed as geography staff and she's Professor Emeritus Brackets Science. So again, we'll come back to that a little bit later as to you know, where geography finds itself institutionally. But I was presented in the interview with a graph of um, global temperature rise. And at the time, um, I then explained that because I knew about the greenhouse effect with the heightened CO2 concentration. And it's quite sobering to think that at the time, the CO2 concentration was still under 350 parts per million. We are now, the last time I checked at the weekend, I think it was 417 parts per million. We could not have imagined that at that time. Um, so many of you will remember the first IPCC report being published um, in, I think it was actually, was it 1990 or 1992? Sorry, I might have got that wrong on the slide here. Um, but that clearly influenced um, me heavily while I was um, at Oxford, and I was really proud to buy my, my hard copy of this particular document. And I didn't know, of course, that we'd find ourselves many, many years later now looking to uh, COP um, 2021 in Glasgow and, you know, still scrambling for a real impactful international agreement on CO2 uh, reductions. But um, it was a quite an eventful time, I think, for geography at that time. And um, there was then also, uh, sorry, that's just here, global warming clearly has, you know, accelerated um, since then. We've seen nearly a degree of temperature rise. But I wanted to move on to really the other events at that time in the human geography side. And also while I was um, at Oxford, David Harvey um, published his book, The Condition of Postmodernity. And I remember far too little about the contents of the book now, although I did read it, read it at the time, but I do remember David Harvey lecturing us from the back of the lecture theatre in order to demonstrate to us um, how our attention would drop if he was no longer present at the position of power behind the lectern at the front of the lecture theatre. And he, he probably spent only a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes lecturing us from the back of the lecture theatre but it, it stuck with me for the rest of my life, this illustration as to how much space and place uh, matters to events, um, where things happen and, and how they happen in that space. And many of you have responded, in fact, accordingly in your um, responses to the questionnaire that I sent out in that geography is inherently a spatial science and um, a you know, discipline where space matters. When I look back now, there are more kind of strange connections. You know, there is the, the in, in his book, David Harvey draws very heavily on the first um, film of the Blade Runner series. And that of course is set in 2019. And that now happens to be the year that I moved to Ireland in, and have really turned my thinking into, into what our discipline really means. And so I'm now kind of missing out a load of, of thinking that happened since then, since my undergraduate years, but these are really formative. And this is really what has, I think, shaped my, um, my attitude, my thinking, my approach to geography uh, most deeply. So I want to turn towards um, the second part of my talk, where we'll go more in more detail at the link between the discipline and the critical challenges and what that means. Um, and I've, you might notice that I've, I've turned existential global into critical here, because I think to define existential global challenges only is probably missing the point. So let's let us start with um, geography as a discipline. And perhaps a good analogy is to think about, uh, or an analogy for the foundations of a discipline, is to think about the the structure that you need in order to build a lasting. Um, house or dwelling. Maybe I'm just now being influenced by the fact that I've recently had to go house hunting for about six months to try and find somewhere to live in Dublin. But it's maybe not a bad analogy. You know, we need a, a foundation that keeps our structure upright and uh, keeps it from falling down. 
and we also um, you know need need to have a foundation for a building or a structure or a discipline that interacts and sits within the context of other disciplines around us has a connection to them that we can maybe build upwards or outwards or whatever we decide to do um, now it's interesting that in um, in when I was searching for what it what a discipline is or what it takes to establish a discipline I found this little quote here from um, Svante Lindquist, who was talking about the, I think, the, the institutionalization of the discipline of um, the history of technology in Sweden in the 1970s. And he wrote that establishing a new academic discipline may be compared to squeezing into a train compartment that is already full and trying to find a seat. The other passengers glare sullenly at you and move only with great reluctance because they're not glad to surrender a little of their own. Geography may not be a discipline as recent as the history of technology, but um, it has its fair share of space wranglings, I think. And this was certainly true in Cambridge um, at a time in the sort of late 19th century or mid to late 19th century when, when geography was established as a discipline in Cambridge. And um, Stoddart wrote, David Stoddart, who's, you know, who, who's basically my supervisor's supervisor, um, wrote in 1975 that in the in the 1860s, even after the Royal Commission in, in the UK had supported the introduction of more subjects alongside what was then the real traditional mathematics and classics. Um, and, and, and he wrote that there were still those in Cambridge at that time who objected to having about half a dozen little tripuses to suit the convenience of men who cannot brace up the nerves of their mind to pen an examination in anything better than butterflies wings. I, these quotes are just real gems that have come out of this little review that David Stoddard did at the time. So um, there was there was an objection, uh, objection and um, there was also a recognition that perhaps you know there, there might actually be some value in setting up other disciplines and clearly uh, geography did, of course, become established, as did, in fact, zoology and botany and other subjects. Uh, and it proceeded um, to geography proceeded to work itself kind of into defining itself into a, a discipline over the years. Um, there is a bit of an insight also in the writings of Stoddart, where he looks at what benefit geography was thought to to be able to have for society at the time. And I think that's also quite fun to look at in that um, he defines this benefit for a certain class of students. So if you look at the, the, the asterisks there, the students who were thought to benefit from geography were those from, from who had expectations in life that have no motive for prosecuting the severer studies beyond the prescribed. But for them to become travelers, to whom a knowledge of natural science and a familiarity with many scientific processes and the handling of a great variety of instruments was then likely to be of eminent use. So we, I think we still see some of this resonating today, the use of techniques, you know, should, te should geography embrace geographical information science and is yeah. that something that defines it? Um, so, uh, it's worth noting here that throughout the, the history of geography, there are themes of it being seen as kind of like an easy option. Some of you have even mentioned that in your responses to the question there, that, that it could be a, a problem. It, not that it is, but it is sometimes still seen like that. And that it is seen as a discipline that borrows techniques and then applies them in a different context. But um, Dick Chorley actually in a... Um, an interview that I will send you all the link to uh, made that as a particularly strong point of the discipline that geography does is very good at borrowing techniques and then applying them in a, in a spatial context to which um, another sort of interview panel member of this this interview link that I will send you uh, Michael Chis Chisholm then says that geography is perhaps more like a Sparta than an Athens and he uses this kind of um, city urban development um, analogy, which links a little bit to our um, building analogy for a discipline, and says that well, because geography is more like Sparta, it's more an outward going and um, a porous discipline than 
Athens maybe was where you have um, the city built around heavily fortified walls. And um, he describes the benefits, benefits of geography uh, remaining, uh, remaining open and out facing as the key characteristic. Anyway, so we can see that the foundations um, as an institution are important and, and perhaps though um, there are foundations that predate the institutionalization of geography. And, and I, I think when we look back and, and we consider some of this excellent um, introduction that Andrea Wolf has given us in her um, biography of um, Alexander von Humboldt, the invention of nature, where um, she's, she's, she describes and quotes him as, as seeing nature as a living whole and not a dead aggregate. Um, one single life had been poured over stones, plants, animals, and humankind, she, she, um, she puts it as. It was this universal profu profusion with which life is everywhere distributed that most impressed Humboldt in the early 19th century. Uh, so way before geography was instituted as a discipline. And even then the atmosphere carried the kernels of future life pollen, insects, eggs, and seeds, and Humboldt could see that all. Life was everywhere, and those organic powers are incessantly at work, he wrote. Humboldt was not so much interested in finding new isolated facts, but in connecting them. And um, it's these, this, this relation to the whole, the facts, the, input, the individual phenomena and their relation to the whole that became important. So looking at this from our own perspective of the 2020s, I wonder if we can take a leaf out of uh, Humboldt's book in how we envisage a future of geography. And we will come back to that later. Maybe we need to go back to go to the future. But um, let's leave that for a moment. And Humboldt, of course, was then followed by others who were also very influential on, on geography, certainly the physical side of geography with um, with Lyell and Charles, Charles Darwin in geology and in you know, general natural uh, history and that, as it was uh, taught and seen then. Um, and um, so, uh, we, so, so I turned to um, you know, some other pieces of literature for, for this talk and I, I want to share those with you. And the first one here is really um, this fantastic little volume by Steve Trudgill and Andre Roy on contemporary meanings in physical geography. And, and in there, um, he, uh, Tim Burt in a chapter charts very nicely how geography, and this is sort of from the left of the slide here to the right, how geography moved from this rather inductive route that, that was really based around um, unordered facts and the focus on classifying and ordering those facts and then inducing some generalization from them to a more deductive route over the course of the 20th century. And of course, the, the, the inductive route um, is perhaps epitomized by you know, W.M. Davis's cycle of erosion that, that actually arguably emerged more out of geology than it did out of physical geography, but has certainly provided some of the sort of foundations of, of where physical geography went throughout the 20th century. Um, and um, it's been argued by a number of geographers, such as um, Dick Chorley in the mid, mid to, to late 20th century, that geography lost its way somewhat over the course of the 20th century, particularly in the, the 50s, perhaps 40s, 50s, before it then, in their eyes, ev evolved into what they call a, a systems science. And um, I, I, we haven't got enough time for, for me to play you this video, but there is a, just a fantastic, um, unless it decides to play itself, no it doesn't, there's a fantastic discussion here on YouTube, which I would really urge you to look up um, between three um, geographers, and one of them is Professor Michael Chisholm, and the other one is um, Dick Chorley and then also Torsten Hagerstrand from Lund in Sweden, who at the time, and this must have been early 80s, maybe late 70s, look back on the 50s and 60s and this, this emergence of geography as a system science. 
Um, and there's a real sense within the interview that there were a number of strong individuals who became influential in encouraging geographers to, to take the subject apart into the components of a system, be it a physical system or a human system. And there was a, there's a sort of lamenting in this uh, discussion that unfolds over the fact that geography is being fragmented and is becoming too atomistic, I think is the word that, that they use, and that the real challenge in, in Dick Chorley's words at the time was to, to put it back together again. You know, how are, how are we going to put this thing back together again? And um, I think I even remember Dick Chorley. He was, I was fortunate enough to meet him while I was a PhD student at Cambridge still, and he was still concerned about that in the mid-1990s. Um, critically, I think, Chisholm then comes back and says that, well, actually, it's impossible for an individual to put it all back together again. So we can't, as individuals within the discipline, represent the discipline. The discipline only exists because as individuals, we look at, individual, at small components within it. Um, and that, I think, surely then calls that the catch-22 situation that we're in. And I think this is a really interesting Thing to maybe come back to later and, and I will come back to it later in terms of how, where we now are in the 2020s and how complex we now understand systems, full systems, human natural connected systems to be. Um, but another uh, dimension of the interview was this kind of sense of lack of clarity of what distinguishes uh, geography as a discipline really and, and it's, it's quite entertaining when Chisholm says in it that he was not clear what the question was that was being asked, but what was clear to him was that it was very important. And so I think it's perhaps not surprising that, you know, we try and maybe define ourselves by the challenges around us, but is that really what we need to do or what we should be doing? Um, as I've already mentioned, you know, Harvey and, and others uh, sort of obviously came and, and developed some of the systems thinking from the 50s and 60s into something very different. And um, so Dick Chorley was, was, is in that interview, Michael Chisholm, Tom Hagerstrand, I couldn't be, find an image of him and loads of many, many others, of course. But you could argue that since then, so who's, who's stepping onto, who's, who's stepped onto their shoulders? And since then, I guess, a number of people have stepped onto their shoulders and either continued to um, to work in the fragmented parts of the discipline, I would argue, or have perhaps taken particular issue with this fragmentation and highlighted the problems of this fragmentation. And so Mike Hume and Bill Adams and a number of others who I consider myself really fortunate to have been able to have discussions with and, and have met um, while at Cambridge, um, have, I think, expressed similar sorts of um, considerations to me or concerns to me. It's very, very clear, though, that it's individuals who are moving the discipline and shaping the discipline forward. And so the, that really begs the question as to where are we all and where are you all? And are we doing enough in our own minds to, to bring our discipline forward as a discipline? Or are we working in the fragmented subfields and not paying enough attention to the discipline as a whole? So I want to share with you, um, first of all, a slide that's obviously out of context, but that I forgot about <laughs> in my notes, um, which is actually just to illustrate to you that I personally also moved into this fragmented way of looking at the discipline. And um, the two people who, who influenced me a lot in that was Professor Andrew Gowdy, who was just a fantastic undergraduate lecturer, introduced me to the nitty gritty of coastal processes and then um, my uh, colleague of, of the 21 years of running the Cambridge Coastal Research Unit, Professor Tom Spencer, with whom I con continued, I, I guess, really to try to unpick how the coastal system works. And you can represent the system of a vegetated coastal zone in, in a simple graphic like this, or you can try to disentangle everything that's going on and it becomes really complicated and we kind of I think went full circle into trying to pick everything to pieces and then seeing that it needs to be put together again in order to really say anything about the system as, over anything longer than a few hours or days. So 
Um, let's go back to where we where we started and let's go back to our role within this. Um, you know, who who runs the discipline and what are our current characteristics? And so I want to um, go to this back to this question as to whether we actually see ourselves divided, never mind this really fine fragmentation, do we see ourselves divided into physical and human geography or, or, or what? And so it's just interesting um, to look at the results of the questionnaire. I think when I put these slides together, there were about 44 respondents. So the numbers are very, very small. And they're obviously all people who are attending the CIG. So um, most of them see themselves as a geographer, which is the categories on the x-axis, and also describe themselves as a geographer, which is kind of heartening to see. There are some who see themselves as a geographer and do not describe themselves as a geographer. And, you know, you wonder why that is. Why do we not go out there? Why, why isn't everyone who sees themselves as a geographer also describing themselves as a geographer? Um, and, um, and then there was the question about attending human geography seminars or physical geography seminars. And so these are the, on the x-axis here are the, the questions that I did ask people to identify themselves as a human or a physical geographer or just a geographer. And it's heartening again to see that, you know, even if we look at who attends physical geography seminars, um, quite a few human geographers occasionally attend physical geography seminars. So we are actually quite, we're speaking to one another, which is, which is great to see. Um, there are also some who didn't provide any answer, and I don't know whether that means kind of no or yes, and we only had four physical geography people respond to my questionnaire, so I'm not entirely sure what that tells us um, about the, the CIG, perhaps, but, you know, that's a different question that we could look at. So where do we go, where are we going with all this? Um, and I think... Um, you know, if we look around us, we, we and, and we ask the question around, about challenges, we could say that we are actually at the moment in a, at a phase where we are trying to kind of define ourselves by addressing a number of different challenges. And I have given you this Mentimeter link, whether it works or not, I will find out later. But, you know, I've asked you in there to identify two or three challenges that you're currently addressing uh, in your teaching or your research or your professional lives. Um, and but actually, if we look around us, there are an awful lot of other disciplines that are also addressing challenges. So, um, so where does that leave us within geography? What kinds of challenges are they? Are they particularly challenges, or or or, or what? And I want to introduce you um, for that. Just well, sorry, we'll come back to this. This is this is the um, the responses to the questionnaires. And there's a relatively even distribution here between climate change, you know, mitigation, whether we are well positioned for environmental degradation or biodiversity loss, perhaps not so much. I think actually the most uh, stark response from the questionnaire was that most people thought that geography is well positioned for um, addressing, extremely well positioned for addressing the sustainable development goals, uh, for addressing climate uh, impact mitigation and inequality. But I want to introduce you to two key papers here that I think are really, um, really interesting and that we should take note of. And um, the first one here um, is a, a paper by um, Tom Spencer and Stuart Lane. It's a real shame that Stuart Lane can't be with us. He was supposed to be, um, I think, attending also the phys uh, critical physical geography session on Friday. But um, so I can bring him into the conference with this paper. In 2016, they, they argue that we are again at a time where geography has perhaps got a little diverted or distracted. And um, while the IPCC has shifted attention uh, to global issues like climate and so on, um, and then we've also had an on the human side globalization and the attention to globalization, uh, the IPC has al IPCC has also introduced rather random sort of time considerations for us where really this is a this is a time scale to 2100 that is generally used in the model predictions of the IPCC that is really just um, a, a climate modeling an arbitrary climate modeling time scale and so as as human geographers we've kind of or as physical geographers rather sorry we've kind of like a bees around a honeypot we've 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 to attach ourselves to to the issues that are raised in the in the IPCC, and um, and this time scale of of to the end of twenty one hundred, and I think actually it hasn't. Maybe they're right that it hasn't been too helpful to focus on this 
systemic change versus what they call cumulative change, which is the, the, more, the, the more unconnected local to intermediate scale processes, which actually have a significant net effect on the global system and, and where the human footprint those is so invisible or unimportant in the IPCC's work group one representation of the world, but actually is really strong and often dominant. And whether that is perhaps where at least physical geographers um, have most to offer um, at this point. So the question then becomes, where do we go from here? Um, where are we moving with that? And there is another paper that just came out this year, um, led by Olaf Slaymaker, where the argument is for a recasting, at least geomorphologies in my physical geography space, recasting geomorphology as what they call a landscape science. And they use three um, examples of, of problems that we're currently facing, sea level rise, permafrost and snow depletion. And they discuss them in very regional contexts: sea level rise in the UK, permafrost thaw in um, uh, Canada and North America, and snow depletion in the Alps. <clears throat> and um, their, uh, their conclusion here really is that, that human well-being actually is a very critical component of geomorphological systems when we view them at this landscape scale. That's the scale at which human agency and human impact kind of come together and um, cause a response of the system as a whole. Um, and for me, that resonates rather a lot with the work I've been doing. Um, and Rhonda mentioned earlier my work on the uh, importance of having green foreshores, vegetated wetlands, for example, in reducing wave energy, which you can see coming in from the right and then reducing towards the left, where we have a human constructed sea defense. And the questions around how we implement nature based coastal protection solutions are inevitably very tightly tied up with a number of different stakeholders, very complex socioeconomic and political considerations. Um, we came to the conclusion when we had a workshop in Cambridge here in 2013, uh, and this publication has emerged out of that, that actually, you know, what we're doing really here at the fringes of the, the in, in shallow water is only a small component of a cascade of different actions that we need to take as human society to protect ourselves from flooding. So um, they are also arguing in that paper uh, that, that we should be redefining sustainability and that we you know, I think there's a, there's a sentence in there, what is it that can be sustained if all around is changing rapidly and continuously towards an unpredictable future? Sorry, that's a typo here. Um, and then they say that the goal of achieving sustainability should be replaced by a strategy of eliminating manifestly unsustainable practices. Now, I, I read that and I thought, well, that's a really circular argument. You know, you're defining sustainability by unsustainability. Um, but maybe there is something in there. Maybe there is something that we do that we should be working with. And, and maybe there is something here where uh, the, the total systemic and cumulative environmental response and decision making that is really required to address some of the problems we're facing requires knowledge of local, regional uh, and in spatial temporal contexts that, that ultimately really have to have this human agency within them. So where does that leave us? Well, I wonder whether in fact the question around our foundations here is very, very tightly connected to the where to question. And this is where I want to go back to Humboldt um, to, to close here and ask the question whether we sh should we go back to the future. Uh, so Humboldt um, started with connecting isolated facts. This is what did is this what geography did before the 1950s. Uh, Humboldt then discovered relations within and between systems. Is that what geography did in the 1960s? And but then actually ended up saying that nature as a living whole, including humans, is what we need to pay attention to. And, and is that really what we should be doing our utmost to now focus on? And, and this, this seeing geography perhaps as a whole, not just maybe geomorphology as a, as a, as a landscape science and human well-being as a critical component of geomorphological systems or physical geography in 
as a whole when viewed at the landscape scale. And here, just again, we, we are facing this, this problem that I outlined earlier, which is that the whole system is so complex, um, as was identified by Dick Chorley and, um, and so on in this discussion, is, is so complex that how can we ever predict it? You know, it's like the weather, you toss a coin and it might rain and it might shine. Uh, and that is the most advanced technologically uh, advanced system that we can think of uh, that predicts the weather with an astonishing accuracy of 50 percent you know or, or do we just so are we just saying that we will never geographers will never come up with any models or predictions because we know that we have knowledge and therefore we don't predict um, and if we were to predict then we would admit that we really don't really have all the knowledge you know where do we sit in that um, that frame of of, of forecasting and, and looking to the future and certainly in my field specifically, uh, our work on coastal dynamics, and, and I know that um, in, in that space, we have a highly nonlinear system. It is dissipative, there's a continuous energy input. It's randomly forced at a number of different space and time scales. We've got tides, we've got waves, we've got storms that are really random. Um, <clears throat> and so there is this kind of tight feedback between what happens at the forcing end and what happens at the response end. And, it's no different to what I learned in my, my year off where I took a, a physics course um, as what governs a double pendulum. If you attach one pendulum to another pendulum and you let them swing, there are no physics in this world that can predict where the end of that bottom pendulum will be after um, a certain number of time steps. And the number of time steps is very, very small. And we are dealing with similar kind of systems, but, but we have something that's happening to us. We, we have um, a real revolution in observation and in, in a canvassing human um, input digitally and canvassing the natural input digitally through, uh, you know, we have, the, we have all of our, we've got used to all of our internet and, and digital technology over the past year in terms of our human connections. We also have satellite remote sensing, we have digitally um, designed environmental sensing uh, sensors that we can pick, pick, put, uh, put out in the environment. So, you know, is, does that mean we need a new kind of system science that we call geography? Um, and if so, what kinds of challenges, whose challenges are we working with? And, and where do we sit in connection with other disciplines? And I want to finish just on the, the threats, a bit of a negative way to finish here, but the threats that were identified in the questionnaire to the discipline. And I, it's heartening that um, actually the majority um, of, of us um, think that at least at the moment, there is no challenge really in terms of discipline identity and, and that you know we have a quite a strong identity within the discipline, although in the future here, these people thought that there might be a likely future identity crisis, so to speak. Um, it's also heartening that attracting funding is not seen, at least by the majority of respondents, as an issue. Uh, ability to attract students, that's a bit undecided, undecided here. Um, but unsuitable university structures are seen by the majority of the respondents to my little questionnaire as a as something that challenges us at the present time. And that is, of course, quite worrying. So we've gone through a huge uh, a list of different questions there, but I think in conclusion, we can say that we have a strong identity. We have the convergence of, of human and physical linkages. And I think that is an absolute necessity. Um, we, I think we can say that the precise whole system prediction thing is futile. You know, we, maybe we shouldn't even um, go there but that challenge specific insights are possible. And maybe therefore, if we harness the observation and location specific knowledge that we now know we can harness, we can overcome the institutional challenges that we have. Um, and that was identified as something that's key. And with that, I'll leave you and I've gone on far too long. So thank you very much for listening. And it's a shame we can't meet on campus. I thought I, I'll send you and uh, show you a little kind of video of what it could have been like for you to walk around campus today in between your sessions. <laughs>